As a point of reference, we got the little timer on the center lectern to work. It will show you a green light when you can speak, yellow light when you have two minutes left, and a red light that makes noise when your time is done. When that goes off and you're up speaking, be courteous and stop speaking. Everyone, please take your seat because the right. is going to begin. Hey, get out of Gordon's way, you. Sit down. Get out of the way. Sit down, O'Connor. Sit down, Trimbley. You, big guy, get out of the way. Sit down. All right, Mr. Cook. Kevin Cook, Precinct 16. I, I just want to point out that um, something to consider with regard to trying to not be stigmatizing and worrying about what's in your particular backyard is that if you draw a 500-foot circle around Arlington Catholic High School and Fidelity House, you're going to wipe out almost all of Arlington Center. And, um, and if, you, if, the, if you are going to consider anything other than the three villages that were mentioned, uh, anything near the high school gets wiped out, too. So uh, I just wanted to point that out. It's sort of, uh, it, it kind of significantly reduces the amount of, of places that are actually available for this. Okay, thank you. Um, this woman right here, yeah. Molly Flickiger, Precinct 14, I'm sorry, 4. Um, a little tongue tie. A few things. Um, I'm glad that the town is considering this issue so carefully, and I understand that they uh, feel, the working group feels that they need to make a proposal. Um, from what I understand about this issue, an RMD is not going to come into this town without a lot of attention and a lot, without a lot of opportunity for public input. Um, I believe that community support is one of the qualification criteria for the state permitting process. So if the state um, it looks for the nonprofits who might uh, be brave enough to try to attempt to open one in Arlington to have had some community support and do some uh, relationship building and if that isn't present I don't believe a permit will be granted. Uh, my ideal solution would be to take a wait and see attitude um, which we may or may not be able to based on the pressure from the state. I think it's very unlikely um, that we're going to see this become an issue anytime soon. This is an experimental issue for the state. The state has very thorough regulations, is taking it quite slowly. I'd like to see someone, again, who's brave enough come together with a proposal and then let the community decide because I believe we will have an opportunity to decide um, if it ever becomes a relevant issue. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Harrington, Sean. John Harry, Jim Precinct 15. Um, just, I talked to Cap Town Council during the break, but I just wanted to clarify that if we were to vote no, this wouldn't be in a residential zoning area, if I'm correct. Mr. Hyman? Uh, by the way, I want to apologize, Doug Hyman, Town Council, I want to apologize if people couldn't hear you? me before. Name? He said it. Oh, I can hear it tonight. <laughs> Get closer. Can we turn the volume up a little bit? Closer to the mic. I want to apologize if people couldn't hear me before. I'm uh, trying to lean down a little bit here to get into the microphone. But uh, with respect to the idea of whether or not um, not zoning it anywhere would necessarily mean that you couldn't zone it in a residential district, I have to say it's pretty unlikely that it would be going to a residential district. But I can't say with an absolute certainty that it wouldn't happen in the sense that our zoning, you'd have to basically be relying on all the other laws of the town to basically tell you whether or not you could place that type of business in that area. So I, I, I just want to make it clear that it is a somewhat nuanced point. All right. Okay. And the other question, I don't know if uh, you'd be able to help me out with this. Um, I saw that there's a 
500 foot buffer zone by the state. If I'm correct? That's correct. Um, is it possible that after this, after this town meeting, as a hypothetical, that we could increase or decrease that buffer zone? It's possible under the regulations that you could either increase or decrease the, bu the buffer zone. All right. So we could, um, so another hypothetical. So we could vote no on this. If it spreads out to the town, we could increase the buffer zone. After that, does. Uh, no, I, I think that it depends on your question. If your question is, if we vote no, can we just increase the buffer zone? You have to have some sort of zoning well, regulation that would increase the buffer zone. That would be your avenue to do it. The other thing that I'd like to make sure is clear is that with respect to zoning regulations, part of the purpose of the regulation is to be flexible over time so that you're not just dealing with where a daycare center is at the very moment, but as time proceeds, and you probably know this, I don't mean to suggest, suggest otherwise, I just I, over time you would want to make sure that there's flexibility. That 500 foot buffer would, as currently, uh, under the current state of the law, that's in place, but you could make it smaller or bigger, but it would change as those congregation areas change. All right. Um, it would have been, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Looking at the screen, it was kind of hard to see the map that was given out. It would have been nice if we had been given a map to look at. But from what I saw, the main area is Arlington Center. As someone who works in Arlington Center, is there almost every day. Kids are there all the time. Whether it's out of school or during school, you have two schools there. I would have liked to see, and if we could have made this a lot broader uh, under what Mr. Rudiman was saying, that make this a bigger zoning area. And because I didn't see that, because I, I don't think that we were properly, um, we weren't given enough tools to look at this because we weren't given a map, um, I'm gonna have to vote no on this simply for the fact that from what, it, from what I'm seeing currently, it's in one area where currently it is huge concentration of kids. And I'm talking from personal experience seeing this day by day by day. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Schlickman? Pass. Pass. Mr. Jameson? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, first off, um, I want to thank the Redevelopment Board and the committee for their hard work. I know they've spent hours, endless hours, in this issue, both last year and this year, and Sometimes the body um, doesn't trust you or take your um, thoughts uh, on face value, and I apologize um, for the body, at least from my perspective. Um, first off, I want to talk about a couple things that were, I think, suggested. One of the previous speakers, Mr. Moderator, suggested that specific addresses be determined. Um, if I understand, if I understood that person's uh, suggestion correctly, um, that would suggest we have specific addresses where things could be done and not other places. Um, I believe spot zoning is illegal under mass general law. Uh, next, an individual discussed uh, the state of Colorado's program, which I think is not a medical marijuana program, but a complete delegalization of marijuana. We, are, we don't have that law in our state. It's only for medical uses. Um, uh, an overriding um, interest for the people who might wish to transit into Arlington should one of these uh, dispensaries be opened um, was access. Um, the spines of, uh, I believe, Mass Avenue and perhaps Broadway, I forget the map. Um, are all accessible by mass transit from both um, in town and um, from other towns surrounding us so that people can get, um, you know, we are, we are a spot on the MBTA map on Route 77, so we're sort of a central uh, transit area that we can hopefully develop in a variety of different mechanisms, but not going off subject. And also there was the concerns of our public safety department and to that regard I would 
we request Mr. Moderator that we might hear a few words from our eminable, eminable Chief Ryan on this issue. Do you have a question of him? I would like to hear. I would like to hear opinions on marijuana. No, I would like to have. <laughs> The, the, the committee um, commented that there was uh, uh, the, the monitoring of the site would be um, uh, best um, performed if it was in these districts, and uh, the rationale from Chief Ryan in that regard would be the most most appreciated in my regard. Chief, can you enlighten us on that? Versus in some back alley. <laughs> Good evening, Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Good evening, sir. Um, I, I think uh, if history repeats itself from what we've seen uh, when Colorado was a medical marijuana state, uh, you correct Mr. Jameson, it's now fully lawful, but it was medical marijuana only. Uh, California and a number of other states, we saw a lot of, uh, of these doctor's notes going to uh, people between the ages of 18 and 24 for conditions such as athlete's foot and <laughs> and other nonsense. And a lot of this marijuana was being diverted to unlawful use. So our concern, uh, or my uh, concern when I met with the committee and my concern remains, that this activity goes on um, in, in uh, the retail areas where um, other business people can uh, exercise peer pressure to maintain the quality of life in our, in our wonderful community. And I think in order to do that, um, what we've proposed makes the most sense. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So um, I would, I would uh, urge a vote in favor, and thank you for um, listening to my comments. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Fisher? Mr. Veraglu? Staff of Araglu, Precinct 10. I have a question. I, I, I didn't catch your name. I'm sorry. Um, during your slide presentation, you spoke of um, the special permit subject to the EDR, and most of the criteria in the, under the EDR were fairly self-explanatory. But um, number eight, special features. Um, can you explain what, that, uh, gen what criteria are generally considered under special features, and if you foresee them being involved in this situation? Okay. Um, special features, uh, Mike Kerr, Chairman of the ARB. Um, that would be Mike Kerr, Chairman of the ARB. Um, special features would be um, with respect to, um, could be air conditioning, could be ventilation, antennas. So it's things like ventilation and that type of thing, which would okay. quite possibly be important here. So, so, so more on infrastructure, essentially. Yeah, yeah it okay. can be. Yep. Okay. And then, um, I guess we've heard a lot of opinions, and I, I certainly respect Chief Ryan's comments on diversion. Um, the one person I know using medical marijuana is in their 70s. Um, they are not in this state. They um, are suffering from chronic pain. They have had every treatment they can possibly get. Um, they have had Botox to deaden the entire area. They have had... Um, so I'm speaking to the article? Okay. Um, okay. Um, and so while I, I understand that there may be diversion, um, I do believe that there will be always um, marijuana available for anybody that really wants it, legally or illegally. And I would support um, this person is in a state where it's not legal to have medical marijuana. And so for the first time in her 70s, she has had to start breaking the law. She has never, I, to my knowledge, ever broken the law before, at least not intentionally. And so I, I do hope we reflect, um, what is it, the 60-something percent of Arlington that voted in support of this and ease the passage of this in and then monitor it like crazy, crack down, enforce, regulate, the whole deal, but let it in um, smoothly. And I do support this motion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Peter Fiore.
Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. Um, more of a comment than a question. Uh, those of you that were here back in 96 may remember that when Congress passed the Federal Telecommunications Act uh, to allow cell phone companies to build out their networks, um, a lot of communities didn't want uh, towers or antennas. And they made their zoning so restrictive that the companies couldn't locate. And the courts came in and said, well, your zoning so restrictive that these companies can't locate, so they don't have to pay any attention to your zoning regulations. They can put those antennas anywhere they want. So my concern is, if we vote no to this, is that, in fact, that could happen to communities in Massachusetts, that if you don't have zoning for these dispensaries, then the court may rule, you know what? That dispensary can go anywhere it wants to. Uh, so please uh, vote for this. I don't want dispensaries in Arlington either, but better they be, we know where, the, where they are than uh, where they may be. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Mr. Wagner. Uh, thank you, Carl Wagner, Precinct 11. I move the question on all associated matters. Okay, we have a motion to terminate debate on all associated matters under the article. Uh, it requires a two-thirds vote. Let's test our clickers out. <laughs> Mr. Finn. Mr. Flynn, are you ready? Yeah, I'm not ready. I'm asking him if he's ready. Okay. Ready? Vote. Do, 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 do. Motion to terminate the debate requires two thirds vote. Sure. On the votes cast, not in the 252, and the votes that are clicked. So time's up. Let's see what we have. We have 157 to terminate the debate, 49. That is a two-third vote. And it says passed over here behind my chair. It's, we haven't figured out how to make that feel better. So the debate is terminated. So we have before us the recommended vote. Hey, our first vote went successfully. Congratulations, Mr. Helmuth. We have before us a recommended vote of the Arlington Redevelopment Board as printed in your report. And again, we're going to take, excuse me? Yeah, it's going to reset when we get ready. I don't have to do anything. It's them. They do all of this behind the scene. We don't have to do anything about resetting. That's Mr. Lynch's, Mr. Flynn's job. Just change your name to Lynch, will you? Okay. Repeat. All right, so voting clock is now open. Vote. Huh? We we're voting on the article. If you want it, vote yes. If you don't want it, vote no. You got five seconds. And stop. Let's see our returns. It is a two-third vote, but what I want to do is go through the screen so we can see it. So sh can we show us the screens? It does pass 160 to 49. That is a two-third vote. So look at your precincts and look at your names. Hey, you can look over here. Can you see that? So this is what's going to be on the website tomorrow, these screens. Oh, there I am. We can also see who's not here. <laughs> so it's an electronic tally, 160 to Okay, so the article carries, the motion passes, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 7. We have a recommended vote of the zoning bylaw comprehensive per 
comprehensive permit application. Does anybody have a substitute motion? Seeing none, all in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? It's a unanimous vote for no action, and I so declare it. That brings us to Article 8. We have zoning bylaw amendment regulations of outside lighting dark skies bylaw. We have a recommended vote of the ARB. Selectman? Oh, we're on to the selectman already? Oh, that's right. Okay. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Then we go back to you. Is that when you guys gonna get up and talk about this? No, no, not you. I got Paul. I got Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Steve Byrne, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. And um, as a board, we voted to support this article. It, um, it's really an incremental change to our current dark skies bylaw. And it was, uh, the changes will protect those residents who are neighbors to commercial and industrial property to make sure there are no, uh, that their neighbor's lights aren't a nuisance to them by shining onto their property. Um, it will be enforced on a, um, you know, you have to call in to the town to have it enforced. But um, I, think, I think it's a great way to make this policy more equitable um, for all town residents and uh, I hope you all join us in supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bear. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. I stand to propose a small amendment to this uh, in se section two, part A, replacing the words adjacent or abutting residential property with the words nearby residential property. And the reason I propose this is to handle the situation where the light from some commercial establishment shines not just on the adjacent property but maybe two properties away, and maybe the intervening property is a commercial property. So as, it, uh, as it's worded, as I read it, um, the, the person two properties away would not have standing to make a complaint about the bright light. But with this change, uh, I, th I think they would be able to uh, make such a complaint. Thank you. Okay, we have Mr. Bear's amendment. You all have it. That would have been on your seats today. I saw him put it down. Okay, Mr. Schlickman, you're next. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, and proponent of this article. Uh, first, I'd like to say I'm very appreciative to Mr. Baer for uh, an amendment which strengthens it, and I urge your support on that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what we're looking to do here is, uh, is to adjust the current bylaw. It's not a very major change, but it fixes a couple of things. Next slide, please. Uh, currently, the regulation uh, only exists to regulate lights that are, are on residential properties, not lights that shine on to residential properties. Next slide, please. Uh, and the bylaw basically, uh, as it's currently stated, use of residential uh, outdoor lighting in all residential neighborhoods. So the problem with the current bylaw, which isn't printed in your handout, is that it limits the uh, bylaw to lights that are in residential properties. Next slide. Uh, so this light, which impacts residential uh, properties, is not covered under the existing bylaw because it is not on 
a residential property. Now, under the current bylaw, if you put a 100-watt light bulb on your house and it shines into your neighbor's bedroom, you can call up and have a complaint. But if somebody puts 940 watts of spotlight, high-pressure sodium vapor next to your house, and it's not on a residential property, it's not covered by the bylaw. Next. And you can see this particular light has a significant impact on many residential properties. Uh, this bylaw is not about the quality of streetlights in town. It's about the, uh, uh, the, the brightness of the streetlights. It's nothing to do with that. But it's the quality of certain lights, which certainly can impact the town. Next slide. Um, it's about fixing things that make it harder to see in, in, a, in a less desirable place to, to live. In, in that this light shining in your eyes is the equivalent of a car driving at you with bright lights or hitting sun glare. Next slide. Uh, and, of course, the light trespass is an issue when it comes onto residential properties when it's not desired. And all we're trying to do is flip the bylaw a little so that it applies to situations such as this. Next slide. And you can see that the, the change in the bylaw is minimal, so that what you're doing is removing residential from the source of light. Uh, and next slide. And, and pointing the light to the residential areas. Next slide. Adding, and you'll see this in the text of the bylaw, you, you are adding some uh, rest, uh, restrictions on the bylaw so that there are exemptions that aren't currently needed because the light source is now on residential properties. Next slide. Enforcement does not change. Next slide. Uh, and the fines and fees schedule doesn't change. So it's not a major change in the bylaw, but what it is doing is changing the orientation of the law from uh, re lights on residential property to basically lights shining onto residential property, which is an important fix. Next slide. Uh, the Board of Selectmen have endorsed this five to nothing, and I'd urge you to do so as well. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Hainer, Precinct 2. I would ask uh, through the Chair uh, Town Council, the term nearby as being vague and how it would be enforced, uh, interpreted. Town Council? Doug Heim, Town Council. Um, I think that there's it has to be recognized that the town, that the term is more vague when you say nearby. It's not um, as uh, crisp as an adjacent or abutting property. Uh, that may have been part of the rationale for the initial bylaw. However, I think it would basically be left into the discretion of the enforcing officer, um, in this case, um, our, our, our zoning officer, to uh, determine, what, I'm sorry, our building inspector, to determine what is reasonably nearby or not nearby. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moderator, my only concern is that uh, the consistency of interpreting nearby and how that would be done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cacavaro. Thomas Cacaval, Precinct 11. How would this affect our uh, parks like Summer Street, Buzzle Field, when they're having a night game and we have these houses across the street and around them? Look, Mr. Burns is going to address that. Stephen Byrne, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, they are exempt from this bylaw, um, and the laws will stay the same for those fields. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sir, right back there, second row from the end, two chairs in. Yep, you. I forget your name. I'm sorry. Oh, Elsie, I got you. I'll put you there. Christian Klein, Mr. Klein. That's it. 
Christian Klein, Precinct 10. Um, I serve on the board of directors for the Friends of Robbins Farm Park. Um, we host lots of events uh, throughout the summer that involve lighting in public places. Um, a question that I had uh, submitted to the Board of Selectmen before they had initially discussed this article was a question on Part B4, which is an exemption for lighting during special events such as fairs, concerts, celebrations sponsored by the Town of Arlington or approved by the Board of Selectmen. And the question is where events that occur on property that belongs to the Recreation Department are not approved by the Board of Selectmen, but rather by the Park and Recreation Commission. Is this an issue? Council? Mr. Smith. Stephen Byrne, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Klein. I uh, don't see that being an issue. I think that um, how this is currently written, because as it says, you know, such fairs, concerts, or celebrations, that we can still take care of that. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Mr. Carmen, did you wish to speak? Yes. Yes. Trembling? At Trembley Precinct 19. Um, I, I note that uh, once again, government has uh, has exempted themselves from another regulation that they're uh, trying to instill on the rest of us. Uh, but Mr. Moderator, I have a, a question for the proponents of this article. Mm -hmm. Give us your question. Um, I, I'd like to know if the proponents have have gone and approached the uh, the uh, offending business owners that control this light to see if they've. Uh, would try to do something about the uh, the way the light shines? Um, well, was there a particular light, Mr. Schlickman, that bothered you and did you approach the owner of that light? <laughs> Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I live on the eighth floor of a condo building, two blocks from the light in the presentation. I do not need a light, night light in my bedroom. Uh, so I referred it to the a building inspector under the present bylaw and nothing can be done about it because it doesn't qualify and I'm not sure who owns the thing. So the your answer. Thank you uh, Mr. Moderator. I, I guess I'll make a comment. In, in general I tend not to like things like this because if you'll remember the original lighting ordinance that we had was based on a neighborhood fight. And I don't think good legislation is made out of neighborhood fights. And I understand Mr. Schlickman's concern. And um, so, so I, I am sensitive to that. However, we regulate ourselves on everything we do. And my personal preference would be just to go talk to somebody rather than make a law out of it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Harrington, Sean. Sean Harrington, Precinct 15, motion to move the question on all matters before it. We got a motion to terminate debate on all that matters before the article. Uh, Mr. Flynn, you ready? We're going to vote by clicker. Okay, voting. This motion terminate debate. It's a two-third vote. Yeah, it's on 20 seconds, right? Ah, uh, hold on. Darn it, this thing clearing. That'll clear when I tell the voting thing, just like on your clicker. It's going to all clear and become empty. Ready? Vote. Look at that. It cleared. All right, now's your time to vote. Motion to terminate debate carries by two thirds. All vote now. Okay, voting window is closed. 159 to 49, debate is terminated.
That brings us before us the recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen and Mr. Bayer's amendment. So, shh, hey, quiet, I'm talking. People have to hear me, not you. We're going to first vote on Mr. Bayer's amendment. He wants to replace the words in the next to the last line of Section A, adjacent or budding residential properties with the words nearby residential properties. After we vote on Mr. Bayer's amendment, we'll vote on the regular proposed article of the Board of Selectmen as it is or is not amended. So, Lynn? Ready? Okay. Mr. Bayer's amendment, whether or not we're going to amend the main motion. So, go ahead and vote. This just has to carry by a majority vote. Five seconds. And voting's closed. 145 in the affirmative, 63. The motion is amended. So, 100. Yes, sir. I could hear him. I have good hearing. Can you go see one of the voting staff members in the back? Even if it did or didn't, it still carries. So it's 145 to 63. The article is amended. Now we're going to vote in the regular article as amended. Yes, sir. Yep. Can you give me a, what, how many votes did you receive? 208. And what's 145 and 63? 208 the last time I counted. And you got 208 votes? Okay. Mr. Dice, did you get your clicker cleared up? Okay. All right, so now we're going to vote on the main article. Madam. Sure. Does it have to do with voting or the article? Uh, too late. They terminated the debate, Mrs. Fiore. It was on the article and all matters before it. They terminated the debate. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. We're going to vote on the regular article as amended. Mr. Flynn? Okay, go. Vote. This is a vote, a, it's not a zoning bylaw, it's a regular bylaw, so it's by a majority vote. The computer may be programmed wrong to think it's a two thirds vote because we thought it was zoning, but it's not. It's a regular majority vote. Okay. Okay, time's up. 211 people have voted. And we have 159 in the affirmative, 52 in the negative. The vote carries. 159, it's an affirmative vote and I so declare. That closes Article 8. That brings us to Article 9. Zoning bylaw amendment, restaurant outdoor seating, recommended vote of no action. Do we have a substitute motion? Seeing none, all in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. Opposed say no. The vote of no action. That clears on Article 9. That brings us to Article 10. Home Rule Legislation Cemetery Commission. We have a recommended vote of no action. Mr. Harrington. Hold on, I have to recognize you. Mr. Harrington has raised his hands. I've recognized him. He can now take the floor. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I would like to ask your um, favor to uh, postpone to time certain until next Monday, Article 10. It's rather complicated. You only got the substitute motion tonight. You'll see it's two pages long. And what I'm asking is a courtesy to your fellow town meeting members, do they have a chance to actually read it and understand it? 
And I think that, um, you know, if I had put together one, I would have put 12 before 10 anyhow. So um, if you uh, make, I'm making a motion to postpone till time certain, Article 10. Second. Okay, we have a motion to postpone. Motion to postpone our, let's look at our handy sheet. They are debatable, and we have Mr. Marr who wants to debate it. Mr. Marr, did you have your hand up to debate postponement? No, I want to speak to the merits of the article. Okay, well, <laughs> well, we <laughs> take note. That's that's debate, sir. We have a motion to postpone. No one else wants to debate. It's two. Th it's a majority vote. All in favor of postponement, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? No. The chair is unclear. We're going to use our clickers. <laughs> Mr. Flynn. Come on, dude, give me a chance. I'm not going to press the 20 seconds till he says he's ready. Okay, this is a motion to postpone. It's a majority vote. Vote. Three seconds. Okay, time's up. Uh, 145 in the affirmative, 147 in the affirmative, 64. If motion to postpone passes, we are postponing till next Monday the 5th. Okay, it is postponed to Monday the 5th. Okay, that brings us to Article 11. Uh, bylaw amendment. Town meeting electronic voting. We have an issue with the way we count our votes and have to display them. We discovered a major faux pas and we want to fix it. Um, is the ch Mr. Byrne want to address this? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Byrne, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Um, the board voted unanimously to support this article. It, um, it's really just a, um, a simple, or not a simple, but it's an adjustment to our vote from last year's warrant. Um, so it will ensure that a close vote now means the same on all votes taken. Um, so for a two-thirds uh, simple majority, et cetera, whereas in under the prior language, there was some variance. So I um, hope that you will join us in voting for this article. Thank you. Mr. Roster. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Adam Oster, priest electronic Voting Study Committee. Um, the uh, the language of the vote uh, is in the selections report. Uh, there's also a representation of the effect of the vote in the report of the committee with crossed out sentence crossed out and new material in italics. Um, it's come to my attention tonight that there is what I assume is an error in the selections motion. The selectman's motion refers to uh, the last sentence of the section of the article of Title I. Um, it should refer to the last sentence of the first paragraph of the section of the article of Title I. Uh, otherwise, we're replacing the wrong sentence. So I hope that is a change that can be made, Mr. Moderator, and, if, and, and, I, and I so move. Yes, that can be made. That's administrative. What do you, what do you want to pencil in? So, so right before uh, in the selectman's motion, right before it says Title I, it should say the first paragraph of. Okay, so it will be that, the first paragraph of. And 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 with that change, uh, the representation in our report will be the same as the result of adopting the selectman's motion. Okay, and if you can make that change administratively. Go ahead and tell us what this is gonna right. do for us. Um, 
the, um, this is the provision in the bylaw that says when the vote's really close, we will automatically treat it all as if it were a roll call. We'll, we'll show the individual votes the way that we've seen earlier tonight. And the, the reason for that is to guard against error or even fraud. Um, you're, you're there not just to verify that your vote is reported correctly, but also that your neighbor's votes are reported correctly. If you see someone's vote who you don't think is there, please rise and say something. Uh, if someone rises and asks if you are really there, please take it in good humor. Um, we're, this isn't going to happen very often. Uh, but what we're changing is the definition of what a close vote is. What we're after is uh, really the, the six votes that are clustered around the very closest votes. If it was 100 votes, 50-50 or 49-51 would be the two closest possible votes that you could have in a simple majority um, where the change of a single vote could change the outcome of the vote. So starting with that and within two of that, you get a spread of the six closest possible votes. That's the definition that we're proposing. The definition that we've got, um, what's wrong with it is that it, def it, def it tries to achieve the same result, but the definition is, is flawed. Uh, it tries to achieve the result by subtracting the yeas from the nays and seeing whether or not it's close. Works great with a simple majority, does not work with a two-thirds majority. Um, to use that example again, if, if you had 100 legal votes, Pat, uh, the, the close vote would be around 67 to 33 or 66 to 34. Those would be the closest. But the bylaw says that doesn't count if the vote's 50-50. You'd have to go through this exercise, which would be pointless because the vote isn't close at all. Um, so that's the purpose of this change. We're not trying to change any policy. We're trying to perfect an error. Um, and uh, I'd be happy to take questions on it, but I hope that explanation has been clear enough and that the report of the committee has been clear enough. And uh, if you agree that you'll support the change. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jamison. Yes. Mr. O'Connor. James O'Connor, Precinct 19, your assistant moderator. And I ask the question, Mr. Moderator, the report of the town meeting electronic voting studying committee that addresses this issue yes. was not received? It was not received, but there's not a recommended vote in it, so it doesn't have to be um, received. It can just be submitted. Okay. Um, just a question. The town meeting procedures committee did not meet on this issue, but I, as a member of that, fully support the article. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions on this article? Oh, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Steve Liggett, Precinct 9. I actually fully support this article, but I did notice on one of the votes when we did a display that in precinct 21 there was a vacancy that voted yes. So I was a little puzzled by that and wanted to that raise vacancy, the question. That um, vacancy was elected tonight by the other precinct members. There so you go. that clicker is still registered vacant, but Mr. Flynn will have that corrected for us next Wednesday. Vacant will now be Mr. May, I believe. Yep, Mr. May. Paul Bayer, Precinct 13. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, pardon my mathematical um, exactitude here, but it seems to me that if you have the situation where, let's say, 150 people were voting and it was a two-thirds required, so that means 
you need 100 votes to be the smallest number needed to prevail. If the actual number of prevailing votes, well, I guess that's the actual number of firm, okay, okay. I, uh, that wouldn't prevail. You'd need 101 <laughs> to prevail if there's 151 people voting. Um, We're just trying to beat the spread here. Yeah, I, I know. And I, I'm, to, to, I'm just not to, sure that this mathematically it. says that, but I can't, I can't come up with the, uh, yeah, the full so thing off, off the top of my head. Uh, the, so. way the, old vote, the way the old bylaw was written, if it was more than six apart, we had to show it. And if it was 101 to 50, well, that's more than six apart, so we didn't have to show it, but it really only carried by one. So what we've done is we put a spread in. If the difference between what needs to win and what is more than three votes, we, we've just kind of calculated it differently. And that's all we're really trying to do is make it so we're not showing it when it's 50 votes apart and we don't have to because it lost. So we're trying to refine the display. Mr. Schlickman. One last question on ambiguity, and I know this is, sounds a little silly, yep. but I was wondering about this. Uh, on the last vote we displayed, Robert Tozzi voted yes and Robert Tozzi voted no. Can we differentiate the Tozies on the list? <laughs> oh, I guess we should. One should be junior, huh? Yeah. No, senior, he's probably not legally senior. So Eric, you take care of that over the week, over the few days with um, OTI. Thank you. All right, anyone else want to debate this article? Seeing none, we have before us a recommended vote of the Board of Selectmen as administratively amended by Mr. Oster, so it reads that, the first paragraph of our Title I, Article I, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's use our clickers on the clicker vote. <laughs> Second. <laughs> nope, this isn't the two-third vote, so simple majority, ready? Okay, let's vote. Four people have voted. Five seconds. Two, one, and and two hundred and eight to one, and two abstains. Excellent. We know it works. It is a majority vote, and I so declare it. Uh, so that is Article Eleven. Thank you very much for helping us clarify that. Eight to one. That's twenty of. No way. That brings us to Article Twelve. Bylaw amendment, Mount Pleasant Cemetery parking restrictions. Recommend a vote of no action. Mr. Harrington's rising with a. Mr. Harrington, you have the floor. Stephen Harrington, Precinct 13. I'm not going to move to postpone this one. So um, tonight we're going to talk about restrictions in. Mount Pleasant Cemetery and parking. Um, if you can make that a little larger. So I always like to ask myself three questions. You know, what's the problem? Why do we care? And what can we do about it? And in this case, the problem is that there's uh, vehicles, out-of-state workers, construction vehicles, um, public employees, all sorts of people are parking in Mount Pleasant Cemetery. And really, I can cut to the chase and get through this in three words. This isn't a temporary situation. This is creating a great amount of damage, and it's very disrespectful to the living. So um, with that said, let me show you why I believe that. Um, why do we care about this? Well, you know, long term, it's created uh, extensive damage in the cemetery that we're going to have to pay for. Um, it's also difficult for residents to pay respects to the dead. Um, they want to go in and visit uh, the cemetery without having all sorts of vehicles parked in the way. And um, we also should care because it really does violate the state of science. Right now, there is no bylaw that restricts parking in the cemetery. There might be a sign, but the police have no way to enforce it because there's no bylaw. All I'm asking for is a bylaw to give a tool so that we can enforce the stated regulation. 
So that's what we can do. We can make a bylaw. It's very simple. So let me go to the next. First of all, it's not temporary. These are the official records from the cemetery commission. Back in 2007, they talked about parking the cemetery being a long-standing problem. In 2008, they were talking about that cars were parking on graves. In 2010, sorry, in 2010, 2011, parking is still a problem. They talked about parking being a problem in the cemetery since 2007 and is a long-standing problem. This is not a temporary problem. This has been a problem that's been ongoing for at least seven years, and it looks like there's no end in sight. So I want to show you some photographic evidence. This is from the town's GIS system. It's not very easy to see here. But this is Satcham Ave from our GIS system looking down. It's from the 2008 image overlay. So this is an image that was taken before 2008. And you can count 19 cars. And this is not a funeral procession. There's no uh, grave open. There's no uh, mourners. Uh, this is 19 cars parked along Satcham Ave before 2008. This is 2010. This is the first picture I ever took of Satcham Ave. This is during the winter. There's no construction going on. You can count eight or nine cars here that are parked in the cemetery. This is 2011. This person was a, um, a resident of the CUSAC building, the elderly housing behind the police station. They parked there 24 hours a day, seven days a week for over a year. Now, why did I care? Because this is the site of my family's gravesite. My mom, my dad, two aunts, two cousins are buried in four grave sites along this area. And those cars that have been parked in there have been actually driving over those graves. And they had driven over them so much that the road surface was completely compromised. And you'll see soon, throughout the whole cemetery, the road surface has been compromised. And the ditch filled with water. And you can see in this picture that on, in July of 2011, we were going to intern my brother who had died suddenly. And he had been, his cremains were going to be placed there. And you can see the small pile of dirt. So we had 100 family members go into the cemetery and have to cross through a ditch They're dressed in, you know, in church clothes. I mean, it was extremely disrespectful. But this isn't about me. This isn't about my parents. This is about everyone who's buried in the cemetery. And you know something? One thing that's certain, we're all going to die. And when we die, it's not, we're not going to care where we're buried. But the people we leave behind will care. This is a car that's been there. It was there today. It has New Hampshire license plates. This is a series of photos from May and then December of 2013, just last year. I have 500 photos. I didn't pick a very good sample. I didn't pick a representative. But I picked some that I wanted to make a couple points. The construction last year on Mystic Street ended November 24th. The two bottom photos are actually from December of 2013. So there was no construction going on on Mystic Street. They were gone. The top photo is from May. And when you see it in May, it's the same three cars that are there. 43 cars. The next day, another 30 cars. Construction vehicles. Winchester police parked two wheels well up on the grass. Nighttime, 8 o'clock at night. Here's 91 Mystic Street. They do not have any parking at 91 Mystic Street. That commercial building has been using the cemetery to park its cars in for the past 10 years. That car there uses a cemetery as its private parking lot. It has Vermont plates on it. You can see that it's actually backed up. There is no, that road that looks like a driveway into 91 Mystic Street, the small brick building, isn't a road. It's actually part of the cemetery. This is the municipal parking lot, Friday, noontime. It's empty. If you see the top photo, we'll show Mystic Street, packed with cars. And the one on the left is Satcham Ave, full of cars. The bottom one, again, it's hard to see. There is so much parking that is within 500 feet of the community safety building that there's no need to be parking in the cemetery. You, within 500 feet, we have over 1,000 spots of parking. There's parking all along 
Summer Street that's not restricted. There's no need. Guess where this is? St. Paul Cemetery. Looks really nice, doesn't it? It's in Arlington. This is Arlington, Mount Pleasant. Not so nice. Guess which one? St. Paul's. Arlington, Mount Pleasant. St. Paul's. Arlington, Mount Pleasant. So thank you very much. I hope you vote for this. Not the English Parliament, no clapping. Mr. Berkowitz. I see you, Sean. Adam. Mr. Berkowitz, did you have a hand up? Oh, the guy next to you then. Someone back there did. Yeah, all right. Um, Janice, okay. Sean? Harrington? Adam Chapterlane? Janice. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Adam Chapterlane, town manager. Uh, just a few points. Um, myself and the article proponent and some of the other members of the <coughs> Uh, town staff and department heads have been discussing this issue uh, for some time and I know uh, again the article proponent has discussed this issue even before my tenure as town manager with the Board of Selectmen that uh, resulted in the placement of some of the stones you saw, uh, saw adjacent to Sachem Ave where some of the cars were parked to protect cars from um, uh, cars that might park there for any use from, from parking on the grass. You know, this, this is obviously an incredibly challenging issue for us uh, by, by choice no one would want to be parking for uh, you know any use other than a cemetery use in the cemetery, uh, but it's a challenge of density and uh, the Mystic Street area in that area where the community safety building is has had a great deal of construction for for really more than the past several years, uh, both construction at the community safety building as well as national grid uh, construction and some water uh, water work on Mystic Street. And the National Grid construction is, is ongoing now. There's actually a, a detour starting tomorrow with that entire portion of the roadway closed off for several weeks. So um, I'll, I'll read to you um, from a communication I recently had with the article proponent um, leading up to tonight's discussion. Uh, speaking about parking on Sachem Avenue, I said, we appreciate this concern as well uh, in regards to some other concerns that were raised. Uh, as has always been the case, uh, we continually work to minimize the amount of town-related parking that occurs on Sachem Ave. National grid work on Mystic Street continues and correspondingly, this dramatically limits the amount of curbside space available. Chief Jefferson remains concerned that his crews need quick and unimpeded, uh, excuse me, unimpeded access to fire apparatus if conducting training at the community safety building. Parking on Sachem Avenue never has been and never will be a first resort but until construction on Mystic Street is complete, it may occur from time to time. Now, I don't enjoy saying that. I didn't enjoy typing it and sending it to Mr. Harrington, uh, but it is uh, a result, again, of the density of the area and um, the high level of construction that's been happening in the past couple of years. I also just want to address uh, a few of the other points that were raised in regards to the road condition in general in the cemetery, as well as the curbsides or the, um, the side where the grass meets the asphalt. So in the capital plan last year, it was $400,000 for water system improvements in the Mount Pleasant Cemetery. So that work is undergoing, uh, is underway right now. And then in the budget that you'll vote on, the capital budget you'll vote on this year, there is a proposed $230,000 for roadway upgrades or roadway replacement throughout the entire cemetery. Uh, so there is a planned investment uh, in upgrading all of those roadways. And as part of that roadway improvement, we'll be considering the um, placement of berms along the roadways where appropriate. Uh, so an, an asphalt berm that would take the shape of a curb uh, to protect people parking again for any use from going up on the grass. And also as part of that roadway reconstruction, we'll do uh, improvements to the grass to improve those conditions that have been described. Uh, and this again has been part of an ongoing conversation that I've had with <coughs> the PW director, Mr. Harrington and, and others involved. So happy to ask and uh, answer any questions uh, about my statements, but uh, that's the, uh, what I wanted to offer. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Weaver?
Janice Weber, Precinct 21. I just, um, I am a proponent of this article with, along with Mr. Harrington, but I was just wondering, um, having four plots down at um, Mount Pleasant, one waiting for me, um, I do go down there and sit in my car and read sometimes. I find it very relaxing. And I walk around there, and I was just wondering, and I do agree with you, but some of the areas are completely a mess, and it shouldn't be like that at all. But I was just wondering if there would be a repercussion on people that would do that in, rather than. Chief Ryan, how would, you, how would you handle that, people visiting the cemetery short-term basis just to visit or to read? Uh, Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Uh, I don't know, Mr. Moderator. I, Mr. Harrington never approached me on this issue. I've never discussed parking with Mr. Harrington on Sage Mav, and uh, he's never asked my opinion on it, so I, I don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. So, okay. Uh, Mr. Rocha. Michelle DeRocher, Precinct 19. Listening to the presentation, I found that I'm certainly sympathetic to some of the issues that were raised, but the wording of the substitute motion is very restrictive, um, stating cemetery business. Um, as an associate member of the Conservation Commission, I go to the cemetery every year for a, a cleanup of Meadowbrook Park. Um, sometimes twice a year, as do many other members of the community, to care for an adjacent area of um, natural beauty that I believe complements the, um, the goals of people visiting the cemetery. Um, so I would like to see if this is passed, some um, limitation on uh, its sweep. There are, I think, some other legitimate uses of parking in the cemetery for um, reasons that are sympathetic to, to visitors of the cemetery. Thank you. Mr. Kaplan, did you have your hand up? Bill? The role he did. Uh, Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Um, I'm not sure, it, it, it may not be a perfect uh, amendment, but I do think it's a real problem, and I think there's a danger of, of minimizing the complaints of certain residents. Uh, not everyone is the most popular person in town, but they still have loved ones that they want to visit at the cemetery, and other people have loved ones there, and I think that, that treating people with a certain level of respect is, is probably a good thing, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that that's been happening so far, so I, I'm going to be voting for this. Thank you, sir. Mr. Jameson? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Gordon Jameson, Precinct 12. Um, I want to get clarification on one thing, and then I want to ask a, um, two questions, maybe more. Um, the, Mr. Harrington, um, the proponent, suggested that there is no ability to enforce any parking like uh, restrictions on in in the cemetery as our bylaws our state law now provide is that correct maybe the town council can confirm or refute that uh, can you answer that question for us Doug Heim town council my understanding is that correct uh, currently that there are signs that say that you're not supposed to be parking in the cemetery. I believe that's correct and undisputed. Um, so it's really a question of uh, enforcement of this issue. I don't know that the bylaw, uh, I'm sorry, that this placing in the bylaw will change that other than to say that it's now also a part of our bylaws that you cannot park there. But sh currently under the signage that's posted there, you're not supposed to park there and I believe that's a Cemetery Commission decision as well as as well as what's so, the other tone. So if so directed by the chief of police, um, the parking enforcement officer could ticket those cars? There's not a mechanism to ticket them. Mr. Harrington's uh, motion has created a specific 
um, mechanism for a financial penalty. But that, has to, that does have to be authorized by something like the town bylaws. So, so I'm confused, and that's, I'm glad I asked the question. Um, uh, so there is no parking signs, and there is, but there is no enforcement mechanism. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that Mr. Harrington has imposed a fine-based scheme, um, but there are lots of areas in town, schools, and other things like that that don't have a specific fine associated with parking there, but it doesn't mean that you can park there. The vehicles might be subject to towing um, if they were parking in the cemetery against the signage and regulations, for example. So, so um, if I park in an area of town outside of the cemetery and it says no parking, what are the current things that could be done to me? I think that's kind of a broad question in terms of if you're... Well, I think it's applicable because it sounds like that those are the things that are going to apply in the cemetery. I want to make sure I understand. If you're parking in some other area of the town that doesn't have a specific town bylaw that's town property that says you can't park there. Yeah, the top of the, top of the, top of the hill at Park Avenue. Um, right. uh, you're parking in a no parking zone. You're going to get towed or a ticket. It's yeah, I mean, the fire guys sometimes park on Park Avenue on the inside because they have a shift change, but I, I don't like that. But um, there, on the inside of Park Circle, there is no parking. Sure, on, under traffic rules. If someone rule, parks there, what are, what, are the, what are the current You guys remedies? are having a colloquy. Ask a question. So, for example, under traffic rules in Order 7A, any violation of rules and regulations can result in towing if somebody reports that something's parked in a no parking area where it shouldn't be, as an example. Okay, thank you. That, sure. That's very helpful. Thank you. Um, so, so I am sympathetic to Mr. Harrington's um, concerns. Um, I, uh, echoing Mr. Tremblay's comments earlier, I don't know if this is something we need to uh, legislate. Um, I have a question for the whoever does traffic, which I think is the, the Board of Selectmen or through the um, town manager. You just ask a question and I decide who gets the answer. Okay. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask the question, so that's why I was rambling. I'm sorry, Mr. Moderator. Okay. Um, is it possible to um, change the signage there so that it has an hour limit versus just a no parking sign so we would be able to have people visit? Right now, technically, the people like Mr. Harrington coming to visit their relatives' uh, grave sites can't park in front of that because there's a no parking sign, correct? No, well, okay, Mr. Secretary Chapdelaine, as the selectman is the Board of Parking Commissioners, can they go ahead and change a sign like that? Or change it to cemetery business only or something, right? Adam Chaplin, town manager. So the current signs say no parking cemetery business only as authorized by the cemetery commission. At the entrances or all, all this, along the, the Sage and Avenue? Uh, I believe in various points in Sage and Avenue. Okay, so, so then the next question is why are we not enforcing that? I guess that's the, the root of Mr. Harrington's question. His, so I, there's no enforcement mechanism. So I think, I think Mr. Harrington laid, uh, laid out some of it in what he provided from the discussions of the cemetery commission. The cemetery commission has very much acknowledged, a prob uh, acknowledged the problem but has worked with uh, both uh, the police and fire departments and coming to an accommodation during the construction periods. Okay. And my last question uh, for the town manager, I believe, is um, so if this is a, a known problem and there are contractors, why don't we make the contracts, um, contractors like to park right next, they'll park on your anything to be close so they don't have to walk. And I, I'm, I'm, that's a personal opinion, but it's what, based upon observation. Um, they'll park on your mother's and grandmother's grave if it gets them closer to the, the work site. <laughs> So, and so, they so, do. <laughs> wait a sec, wait. Is there so, a question it, in that? So, so the, the, the question is, is there a way to have the contracting process for the town when there are places close to the cemetery require them to park in the central parking and that the town could provide them with that parking in the central, in the central lot that Mr. Harrington noted? So, uh, and that could be used for all the other people that park there, too. So, so if I may clarify your question, in the request for proposal to the contractor, you want to put, you can't park on Sachem Ave, you got to park up in, in, in Russell Field. Can we do that, Mr. Chapdelaine? So I think yes there's a, no? I think there's a, I'm sorry that I, ha I, I can't say yes or no to this. I think there's a, a okay. misunderstanding of the issue. Uh, the, most, of the uh, the, most of the work that has created no parking on, uh, on Mystic Street has been national grid work. Uh, the work that's going on in the building has also created some no parking. And while I can't say that contractors may have not been on Sagem Avenue, they were for a long time taking up parking on Mystic Street, which then 
is what created some of these parking issues on Sachem Ave. So they, they were very close to their work site being the community safety building. Yeah, and they parked their car all day there and, and do the work, I understand that, but they're, they're, they could have been put somewhere else and walked to the site. You got 10 seconds. Okay. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this one, thanks. Thank you. Okay, we got a motion to adjourn. Second, wait a second, we're gonna vote with the clicker to adjourn. We're gonna see who's still here. But first, do we have any motions for reconsiderations on any of the articles we've heard tonight? No articles for reconsideration. All right, all in favor of adjourning, Mr. Flynn, are we ready? Stop that noise. Okay, this is how we're going to tell if you're still here. And we got a green card, so let's vote to adjourn. All in favor, please press one. All opposed, please press two. And Time's up. Motion to adjourn, 164 in a favor, 38 if the motion does carry. We will continue on Monday. We'll pick up the list exactly where we left off. So formulate your questions so that we have some nice, concise debate. <laughs>